and he does miracles. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need something, you just need to worship him. You just need to lift your eyesight, your, 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 your spiritual eyesight to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is great. He does miracles. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We exist to change lives. Amen. Amen. We exist because He's in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's the giver of life and strength. And He gives it more abundantly each and every day. Hallelujah. 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 I want to wish the Gunyans happy anniversary because tomorrow is the day if I've got my calendar right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to give a big shout out to everybody that helped last Sunday and Sunday night. Give Pastor and, and Ray and Joanne a, a thank you. I want to thank you. As a, as a church family, you made me feel good to be a part of you, to come and and celebrate. Amen. Amen. So thank you each and every one. God is good, isn't He? May He have His way in this service. May He walk amongst us here. And may He walk amongst those that might be watching online now or later. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I'm very thankful to live in America today, Pastor. Every day this week, it seemed like there was another country that was being faced with persecution. I'm talking about Christians. And several of your brothers in Christ have lost their lives in other countries this week. The militants are coming after Christians in other countries. If you don't know it, you need to listen to the signs of the times. Amen. I put an article in there. It's just another that Jim Stone found near, near the city of David. Hadn't been, they, they're not aware of anything like that in over 2,000 years. But it had a, an engraving of a, a tree that we know as the Balm of Gilead. What does that mean? It just stirs my spirit. It just says archaeologists are finding something else. What was that tree used for in ancient times? It was the most expensive ingredient that went into the oil that they used in the tabernacle, that anointing oil. They're still growing those trees in Israel today near the Dead Sea. 
but no one had ever found a art artistic rendering or an engraving. Why did someone engrave that in a amethyst stone? And why did science? It spoke to the man that's raising trees. He said this was just like something that spoke to me. When they took it to him and they said, can you tell us what you see? And he said, I've never seen anything like it. But that's, that's, that's the tree, as we know as the balm of Gilead. God's alive and he's moving, church. Let your spiritual ears hear. Hallelujah. Let's take up an offering this morning. Let's pray. Let, don't forget your brothers and sisters in other countries. Hallelujah. Father, we love you in this house. We thank you, Father, for the country we live in. We thank you for the safety and the freedom we have to gather together and to worship your name, Father. Let us not take it granted that we give you a shout in this house this morning. Because we can, because God is good and we have the freedom to let it ring in this place this morning. Oh, thank you, Jesus, Father. We just lift up our brothers and sisters all around this globe. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for all you're doing in other countries. Father, give your people strength. Father, let them run the last course, the last mile, the last steps of this race with strength and perseverance and an anointing, Father, that they're going to make it. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is standing on the brink of glory, getting ready to step foot. Oh, yeah. Yes, getting ready to give a shout. Oh, yes, getting ready to let the trumpet roar, Father. We worship you and give you praise in this house. Thank you for blessing the finances of this house. We just lift up this offering to you and give it back to you. And thank you for your blessings, Father. Thank you for the man of God that will step in this pulpit. May he preach with the unction and the anointing this morning to encourage, to break through father to deliver father and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Christ Jesus name we pray amen Shout to the Lord, all the earth. power and majesty praise to the King. kids already got the idea. You're dismissed to Children's Church. Amen. Amen. Didn't take much to get them going. Yeah. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, find the book of Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Hallelujah. Begins to read and says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go you also into my vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand you here all the day idle? And they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. And he saith unto them, Go you also, and saith unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. 
So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his servant, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they had supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto the last even as unto thee. It is not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own. Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few are chosen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And I pray, Father, Lord, for the anointing. Lord, to send forth, Lord, your anointing, Lord, to every ear and every heart and every mind. Lord, those online, Father God, Lord, and those to watch in the near future, Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, for an unction of the Holy Ghost, Lord, for a touch, Lord, from heaven, Lord, that you would cleanse our ears and our hearts and our minds, Lord, that it would be centered on you today, Lord, that we would hear from heaven, Lord, that we would turn from our way, Lord, and yield to your word, Lord, and that we'd be obedient to it, Father God, Lord, that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand, Lord, so that we may be exalted in due time. Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, for the lost sheep, for the house of Israel. Lord, I pray for the lost, Lord, in this community. Lord, I pray, Father God, Lord, that the church of Jesus Christ would get a burden and a hunger, Lord, to seek out those that are lost and undone. Lord, that we would preach your word in season and out of season. Lord, that we would be ready for the fields are white and ready for harvest. Lord, I pray, Father God, Lord, for a divine humbling, Lord, across America, Lord, across this nation and across this world, Lord, from every pulpit, Lord, from every pew, Lord, that you would humble yourselves. Lord, I can hear in my spirit, Lord, the bleeding of sheep. Lord, that there is a lost people, Lord, that is crying out, Lord, for a taste, Lord, of your name. Lord, a taste of your will. Lord, and we set back, Father God, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that you would usher us in. Lord, Pastor, uh, Reverend Bob preached it, Lord, and I just, Lord, it's burning in me, Lord, that a kingdom acceleration, Lord, needs to take place in our life. Lord, that we get our mind off of us and our mind and our heart centered on you this morning. Lord, and I'll give you all the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. I've kind of struggled with this message a little bit this last week and studying it between this and Hosea, um, studying some certain things that the Lord's laid on my heart and and I'm, I like to really preach about some, some, I like to say deep things in the, in the, in the Gospels and in the, the Old Testament. I like to search out certain things and a lot of times the Spirit of God will encourage me to go there to search it out so I can learn for myself. Um, because I need to be taught. I need to learn. I need to be humbled. I need to seek the things of God. I, I, that's what I need in my life. And I believe that's what every Christian needs. But at times, we get so consumed and so busy with our lives that, that we forget what is important. And, and at first this week, I was struggling with a title, whether this is to focus, because I'm, I like to really watching some of the videos of, of, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, whenever he's working out, he'll just yell out of nowhere, focus, and he'll get back to the intent of what his purpose is while he's there. But the Lord checked me this morning, and he just simply said, side adjustment. Because I believe the church has a focus. I just believe that at times we're getting off target. Does that make any sense to anybody else? That if we're not careful, we will shift our sight and it'll get off target, off of purpose, and then we'll walk around in our self-pleasing selves if we're not careful. The reason why I say that is because it's easy. If, if Look, church, if I was the enemy, I would have you so burdened down and bogged down with things in your life, with trials, with sickness, with situations that continue to rise up so you never have your mind on what is important, but you have your mind on yourself and your need and the things things that are going on in your life and in your family. Can we relate to that? 
Right? I'm serious now. Listen to me. It's easy to get centered on what's going on in our life. So much so that when somebody comes to you in good faith and asks you and begins to share with you what's happening with them, it becomes a competition, a battle of who's got it worse than the other. Right? You ever been in that kind of prayer group? It's kind of, kind of intriguing at times. Right? Y'all come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But I, I need you to understand something that, that that is not what it's about. We are to share one another's burdens and then to take them together to the Lord in prayer. Now, I do know, and I thank God for a little bit of wisdom that I've received from God, is that you can't share everything with just anybody. They need the people of like faith, with like passion. Their side is adjusted and ready. It is on target and ready to go to war, right? Or can we agree there? So, so if we all know these things, we have to be really diligent about what we're doing and what we hear. And whenever somebody is sharing with us, we listen not to respond, but we, and not to respond in like we're prepared to say something to counter that or, or necessarily preach to them or, or tell them what needs to happen in their life. We just need to go to war with them. We need to lock shields with them and go to town, so to speak. But, the Lord really encouraged me to entitle this side adjustment because I believe every single day that if I'm not careful, if I don't start my day in prayer and in the Word of God, my sight picture will be unclear. Now, whenever I was in training which, between uh, law enforcement and just uh, everyday life and growing up shooting guns, um, there's something really intriguing that I never really understood and never really thought about. Because if you're not careful while you're lining up your sights, you will get... The, the picture of your rear sight and your front sight, and that will be all you see, and the sight picture, the target, will be blurry. That's backwards from what they teach you in, in, in military and in law enforcement. You need to have a clear target picture, and the sights ought to be blurry. They ought to be lined up. And it ought to be like a little silhouette, and you ought to be able to tell where it is pointing to, but your target needs to be clear. You see, it's easy to get on our sight. It's another thing to get on target. It's easy to pull up and see the sight picture, to see the, see the sights, but it's the sight picture that is important. What is out there that we're aiming for. The Apostle Paul said it like this, I press towards the mark of the high prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. His prize is Christ Jesus. His prize. He said, my joy and my all, I abound and am full in Christ. I am strengthened in Christ. You see, it's in Christ that we have and we abound and I'm jumping the gun but I can't help myself. But it's simply this, that it's Christ Christ in him crucified. It's him in me that accomplished it. Pastor Ray preached a message about the anointing gets borrowed and there's a time limit on it and it expires today and it's fresh and new every morning. If God tarries his coming today, then the anointing that we feel today, it'll be new and fresh tomorrow. Well, aren't you glad that his mercies are new every morning? That his grace is sufficient in every time of weakness and every trial? He is still a good God regardless of what we faced yesterday. Today is a new day. Thank God for the naming of this house. But it is a new day for us to walk in the joy of the Lord. To put on our strength. To be clothed in humility. Look, we all come to certain things in life. It's the enemy's plan to kill, steal, and to destroy but thanks be unto God that it is Jesus' plan to give you life and life abundant your sight picture must become clear you must not lose focus you must stay on target and man I'm here to tell you every wind wants to turn you and adjust you look two clicks on a scope will get you off for two inches at a hundred miles not a hundred miles at a mile or a hundred yards Right, It'll get you off a great distance. And at times we have to get refocused. That requires a tool. Some of us can do it with a thumbnail because we've done it for a long time. Some of us need a pocket knife or a screwdriver uh, to get this side picture adjusted. Some of them new scopes are stinking awesome. Have you ever seen the new ones that's got the little crank on it? Those are pretty cool. I don't have one. I'm old-fashioned. I've got the old clickers. How to get the pocket knife out. i got to get a special tool. Can I just tell you that you have the tool that you need to get readjusted. You have the tool that you need, the tools that you need to get your sight 
It's back on the right thing. And that's the beauty of all of this is that what, the, what God gives his people is for their good, not for their harm. God's plan is to prosper, to give future and a hope, even as our souls does prosper. At times we do not prosper our souls, and that is an issue. The side adjustment requires a true purposeful intent of the heart. Being humble requires us to be clothed with it. What do we do with clothes? They look good and they look great hanging up on a hanger, but until you put them on, you're naked. Right? We have to make the conscious choice to put on clothes of righteousness and humility. He is our righteousness. He is what keeps us humble. The word of God will instruct us and lead us and guide us into all truth. But here's a, here's a funny thing. That, that if I was the enemy, I would have church people and church leadership so struggling with the fact of position and title that they're so consumed with who is and who isn't and what is and what isn't. But the problem with all that is, is we get so wrapped up in it that the sheep are bleeding and crying out for mercy, crying out for grace. And we forget that just like these laborers that were hired, God gives to all men liberally. That there is not a laborer level of faith. It is the measure of faith that there is not a level of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of a living God. I, I, whoo, I believe that God can do more with a new convert, a new believer in Christ at times than He can do with the seasoned elder in the church. And the reason why is because we have been crippled by theology rather than truth by empowered by truth that God it is the same God who gives to all men liberally it is the self same spirit it is the same anointing it may be in different avenues we're going to get to that in a minute and I don't want to jump ahead but they that minister the Bible says wait on ministering the next time somebody asks you why you ain't doing something say I'm waiting on the Lord the next time somebody says why don't you shout say I'm waiting on the shout to arise it's coming. There ain't no doubt about it. I believe everybody in here at one point in your walk with Christ has shouted a shout that they will cause the enemy to tremble and to shake. Can I get an amen? Right? But there are times where you're going to remain silent. There are times where you're going to be seated prostrate on the ground. You're going to be laid out. There are times that you're going to be leaping and shouting. There are times that you're going to have to lock yourself alone in a closet with the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. There are times that you're going to have to get by yourself. There are times that you're going to be so quiet, but them lips and that inner well will begin to bubble that there is a pot boiling on the inside of you and it's about to come out. And watch out, devil when that closet door opens because they're coming out victorious, right? That's, that's, God is good like that. Look, I believe that Jesus gave us the greatest example in Scripture. The Apostle Paul said he is our chief example, if you will, that he is the one that we should follow after. Matter of fact, ain't that how he started anyway? Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me. They had no training. The only training they got was when they was with Jesus. The training that Jesus got was with when he was with the Father. Oh, come on. He did it early in the morning and late in the evening. He separated himself unto the Lord and went unto the mountain and prayed. Matter of fact, before he left, he looked at them and said, You stay here, pray. And they fell asleep. The problem is, if we're not careful, church, we'll fall asleep. We'll forget the true purpose of being called into this thing. Pastor Sean said it this morning from behind the keyboard. And Pastor Charles said it from behind right here that we're called to go out there and win them. We're called to somebody else. We are called to duplicate what God did in us to redo it in this walk, in this life. And the only way that we can do that effectively is to remain humbled under the mighty hand of God and be last. Look, if I never get recognized another time in my life, praise be unto God because I can't stand it. And that's almost a lie because there was once upon a time that I really loved to be affirmed. There's only one person that I really need to affirm me. Well, let's go two. I'm going to say two. Two people I need to affirm me. That's the God of my fathers. That's my God and my wife. She affirmed me we're good. And there are times that she's going to have to affirm, affirm me. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. There's going to be times that she's going to have to reaffirm what she affirmed because there's going to be times that I'm just going to mess it up, right? <clears throat> but thanks be unto God that we are not consumed. There's a plaque right back there that says it. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Look, 
These workers show us what happens when we take our eyes off of the Lord and when we get our focus on ourselves rather than on what we have done rather than what he is doing. The Bible teaches us that there is no gift given that doesn't come first from God. No good and perfect gift. It's his. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. We are using it. We're on borrowed time. We are we have been given the authority. His authority. His kingship, his priestlyhood. We have been given his righteousness, the cloak of his righteousness. We have to put that on. And if we're not careful, we'll try to put our own on. And let me tell you, that's never pretty. It's never pretty, and it doesn't even smell right. So much so that we can recognize it as believers. We recognize when it's pure and when it's not. But again, I, I need us to understand a, understand a few things. Um, John Maxwell lists five things that, four things that, that we need to be aware of whenever we get our mind and our eyes off of the Lord. And the first one is it's that self-absorption. And I was reminded with just that statement, number one, me first, self-absorption. And then Samson and Peter, they became really self-absorbed and they fell. They came short, right? And the Bible teaches that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all come short of it. But thanks be unto God that it's new and fresh and His mercies are new every morning. We get chances. We get opportunities. Then we need to pray that, God, that I don't let another opportunity slip by or pass by. I want to seize that opportunity. I want to be that witness. I want to minister to those that are in need. If we're not careful through self-absorption, we'll begin to grumble and complain about our inequalities. And by that, I mean the lack of recognition, the lack of fairness, the lack of, of justice, that what we feel is right and true and what should be done and what shouldn't be done. If there is never another an opportunity to stand for me behind a pulpit, then I pray that I strand on the street corner and I preach it anyway. If there is never another opportunity for me to declare Jesus Christ within a house of God, then I pray that I do it on the mountaintop. I pray that I do it in the valley. I pray that I do it in my home. I pray that I do it at the schoolyard. I pray that I do it at the podium. Y'all with me this morning? That it doesn't mean just because this is an opportunity. I remember an old man that used to stand around at Quick Trip standing on a soapbox preaching. What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong is the church went around saying that guy's crazy. That's really what happens. I cannot tell you how many times how many of you have been through Oak Mulgee? There's a man that wears a robe, carries a Bible, and a little bitty pool noodle cross around everywhere. Through every gas station, and he's just constantly walking around praying, and he's waving his arms, and he says that I will never stop praying for my city and my city's leaders, and he's constantly walking around. But he has been labeled a lunatic, a nut, mentally incapable, insane, and he needed to be in a nut house. But thanks be unto God for people like that that don't listen to nobody that will go to the dollar store because that's all they got, and they will get a pool noodle and fashion it in the shape of a cross and carry it around and wave it around and carry the Bible and pray. Too bad that doesn't happen in church, huh? <laughs> just, just kidding. We need the true intent of the heart. That this man's plan is to cover his city with prayer. His purpose. I, I'm, you you got to be careful. You'll mess up one of these days and you'll stop and you'll talk to one of them. You see, I stopped at Glenpool one time when I was working at Johnson Controls. And there was this man and all he was doing was running around saying, hmm, King Jesus, a King Jesus. And he was walking from pump to pump around everybody's vehicle just talking about King Jesus. And then he would start preaching a little. And then he would start saying, it's time to repent. It's time to humble ourselves. And he would go, hmm, King Jesus, a King Jesus. And then he would start dancing around that little thing. I thought for a minute he was going to twirl around and hit the emergency shutoff just to get everybody's attention, but he never did. But my point is, is that these people are labeled lunatic and crazy. Can I just say that the Pharisees labeled Jesus crazy? That he was a lunatic, that he thought he was the son of God. Who would have thought? He was of the Father, born of the Father. I'm here to tell you, he was the son of a living God. And he was a lunatic and a fanatic for the will of his daddy to do exactly what he said he would do. And I'm jumping way ahead, but I've got to get it out. John Maxwell says that Jesus died like us so we could live like he lived. 
He said, greater works than you will do than I did because I go to the Father. I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you comfortless. I will give you the Holy Ghost. What type of Holy Ghost? The second level, the third level? No, the former and the latter together at one time. That means what they walked in back then, we're walking in a greater measure today. Church, we have the power of God given to us to walk and to exercise judgment on the lost and dying world. Not the believers, not the Pharisees, but to exercise judgment on the enemies of God. That we can declare the word in due season and see the fruit of it come to pass. That's what we're called to. Self-absorption leads to grumbling, complaining, and whining. And if you're not careful, you'll start digging a trench with your march for 40 years in a wilderness. Go read it. They spent 40 years walking in a big circle. Whining and complaining. God is feeding them manna from heaven. Man, taste and see that the Lord is good. They tasted, they were thankful, and then after the first year, they started going, man, this is kind of getting old and walking around. And they started murmuring against God, murmuring against God's leader, murmuring against what's going on, begin to complain and why. And God kept sending the quail. God kept sending the dove. God kept sending the manna. So much so that he fed them so much because they whined so much about not having enough that they began to rot in the field and they had to go away from it because it began to stink. You see, if we're not careful, we'll start stinking. Because we've been complaining so much. It is not a sweet smelling say, have you been around a complainer? They will bring you down faster than you can build yourself up. You can't lay bricks quick enough to build a wall to separate from that. I'm telling you. And we all know somebody. And I think this is the problem with the local New Testament church. We always know somebody. I'll never forget preaching a message at another church. And somebody coming up to me after service and saying, I know exactly who that message was for. But they wasn't here. And I thought, (laughs) yeah, they was. You just didn't get it. We're all, it's always easy to look and go out the, outside the four walls. And by that, I'm saying look, not looking within us and applying the word to us before we look at somebody else and say, yeah, that would have probably been good for them if they'd have been here. Right? We all, we all are easy to do that. It's easy to do that. But that leads to the comparison trap. That we begin to compare ourselves to others. And that's the second thing John Maxwell said. But before we get there in Romans 12, 3 and 8, self-absorption. In Romans, the Apostle Paul begins to write and says, that for I say that through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What measure? The measure. The measure of faith that Rim has is the measure of faith that I have. Now, have we exercised faith differently? Maybe, but this little guy right here is probably trumping me on faith. He can believe God to move a mountain to heal a broken wrist that I can feel flopping on the inside of his arm. Like, literally, it's the weirdest thing ever when you go to holding a broken bone. But he can believe God for that to do something great in his life. He can believe God to do more for him than what he's done for me and Tara. Look, I'm here to tell you it's a measure of faith. And that measure is enough every time to believe God despite what is going on in your life. In verse, in John 15, 5, Jesus says that apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me. Jesus says in John 15, 5, that you can do nothing apart from me. But with me, you can do all things. He says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the latter part of the verse. It's a reminder that it's borrowed. And if it's borrowed, look, you have to receive it. I can give you a blessing to do something. I can give you a jacket. I can give you a coat. Or if you're a pastor, you can be given a tie. But the majority of the time, that tie remains in a box or in a closet. Because it's a pretty weird tie. (laughs) I'm just saying, I don't need no ties. (laughs) I've got two boxes of them. Anyway. I was a rabbit, but, but look, if, if you get a coat bought for you or a pretty jacket or a pretty sash or a pretty purse, and, and look, you women, y'all don't buy shoes just to leave them in your closet. I don't buy shoes 
just to leave them in my closet. I wear out shoes faster than anybody on the face of the earth. My wife can testify and say amen to that. I can wear them out as just quick as I can get them. I don't know why. I just I use them for everything. It's lucky I haven't mowed grass in these yet. But again, we, it's borrowed, and we have to utilize it. We have to put on his righteousness. We have to humble ourselves. To be humble is to put on humbling, to be submissive, to submit ourselves to him. And so we can't grumble and complain because that leads to a comparison trap. And what happens with comparison is we ignore God's grace remaining preoccupied with the status of others or ourselves. The worst thing for a new convert in the house of God to do is to listen to a seasoned... No, I take that back. I'm not going to say it like that. The worst thing for a new convert can do is to look at themselves and say, I don't measure up to what somebody else behind the pulpit. You may not be called behind the pulpit. You may not be called to that, but wait on the ministering and the Lord will minister through you in that time of your need or into the need of others. You're going to reach people that the person behind the pulpit will never see. God is going to use you. God is going to use you. And for us seasoned, let's be careful and not tell them that they can't be used because then we undermine the grace of God and the measure of faith that is given unto them. Do we need to be wise where they are utilized in church? But the, here's the thing about a new convert. As you step into leadership into the house of God, rights and privileges seems to diminish in your life. You give up certain rights. You give up certain position. You give up certain things to conform your will to that of the leadership or to that of the Lord. You give yourself over to Him wholeheartedly and you deny yourself. A new convert has a pretty broad base. They can be almost used anywhere. And some people will frown upon it, but they can be used to vacuum the floor, to clean the door. They can be used in prayer. They can be used in helping others come to know the Lord because there is something on the inside of them that has been lit. It is a fresh wildfire, if you will. And that's something that you can't contain, and we got to be careful not to cover it and smother it out. We need some fanners in the house that will fan that thing, and we got to be careful about comparing, and we got to be careful with telling them what they should have done in service or what what they could have done in service and just encouraging them and what they are doing in service that they got up today and they made a change that what they once did they're no longer doing that now they're serving the Lord look you can build people up fast but if you're not careful you can tell them down a whole lot quicker we have to be careful because the comparison trap will leave us in a state where we ignore the grace of God and the call of God. We begin to elect and select who can have certain rights and privileges and who can exercise certain rights and privileges. That's what I love about Pastor Ray. He sees the potential in people and he will enable them to do whatever God calls them to do. And he will oversee that. He will answer for that. And he, does, he knows all this stuff. He knows the word. There's no doubt about it. And he enables people and empowers people. May we be people empowerers just as Jesus empowered us. That we would receive that example and give ourselves over to him and receive from him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, this is what the Apostle Paul begins to write to the church at Corinth. He says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that that didst not receive? So what he's saying is, is what do you got that wasn't given to you in the first place? What is it your glory? Is it your anointing? We heard it last week or a week or so ago. Is it your anointing? Is it your calling? Or is it the calling of God in Christ Jesus? That's what it should be. But we have to humble ourselves. It says, Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou had not received it? What he's saying is, is you're glorying. Be careful not to glory in it like it belonged to you in the first place. It is borrowed. It is being used because somebody, God himself, is allowing you to operate in it. 
And I am glad to do that. I'm glad that it's bald and it doesn't belong to me because that bears a weight of responsibility that I just do not want. But it still bears a weight of responsibility for you to utilize it. You have to choose to put it on. You have to choose to step into it. And you can't compare yourself to that of others. You have to be careful with the comparison thing. Peter compared himself to Christ and said, if you die, I die with you. And guess what he did? He didn't do it. He ran and hid. First he denied. Then he denied again more passionately. Then the third time he denied so great that they started questioning whether or not they were right and thinking he was a disciple. The dude is swearing and telling them off, saying, no, I don't know this crazy nut. That's the nice way of putting it. And you better believe it. Jesus' ear was in tune. And the heart of God was pricked. Whenever it was said. But you see the beauty of God is. Is that he knows your future when you don't. He knew that following the day of Pentecost. Peter would stand up. And defend the faith. He knew that Peter would go on to be a great tool used in the kingdom and that he would never forget that he was buffeted back there and he would press towards the mark and not give up and never deny Christ another time. Look, God knows your potential. God knows. And let me just tell you this. The enemy knows your potential. That's why he works so hard to keep you busy and distracted. That's why he's got you focused on the close up front things rather than the things down the line. You see, the worst moment in law enforcement training that I had was shooting a slug from a 12-gauge shotgun at 50 yards. I absolutely hated every bit of it. That's a long ways to send a slug down range. And then I thought that was the worst of it, but then they wanted me to shoot my Glock 40 at 50 yards, one-handed, freehand, no prop at 50 yards, and score on target. And I thought, that's a long ways down range. I was focused on my rear sight when I needed to be focused on what was down there. I remember back in the day watching Three Ninjas. Y'all don't know nothing about that. But, but I was the world's greatest ninja at one point. At least I thought I was. I watched the three ninjas, and, and Colt was my favorite because he was the middle one, and I was the middle kid, and you know, you're always left out, so you got to do something. So I was the cool one. I was the one that was stubborn, stiff necked. I was the one that always wanted to fight. I, I related. I related to this dude. But he was taught by his grandpa to focus on the target, and the target becomes bigger than everything else. Oh, y'all, come on, get this with me. When we focus on God, He becomes bigger than all of our problems. When we magnify God, He becomes bigger than everything else that we go through. We need to focus so much so that as He was focusing, even in playing baseball, that they were taught to focus on the ball. The the target becomes bigger as it approaches you. And as you focus on it, but we have to be careful not to be so focused that we miss what God is calling us to do along the way. You can be so focused that your focus becomes on self rather than on what God is wanting us to shoot for. And as we go, as we march leading others, be careful of self-absorption in the comparison trap. The third thing John Maxwell says is presumption, that we have to be careful. The presumption that we assume too much. We assume too much when it comes to rewards. Forgetting that every blessing is a gift first from God. Well, I did this, and so I need one of these. If that's the reason why we're doing things, then our intent of the heart, our sight picture, needs adjusted. We need to adjust our sight. It's not about what I can do, but it's about what He will do. If his people, which are called by his name, would humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. Look, there is nothing more comical than somebody's telling, telling you like me, because I used to use this a lot. It's like, well, I wish you knew my heart. I wish you knew what was going on, because I've, I've read in the word you know, over the years that the heart of man is always deceitful, higher than anything else, deceitful above all else. 
that the heart of man is selfish in its intent, selfish in its, in its origin, not how it was originally designed, but because of sin, we become self-absorbed. What can I get out of doing this? What can I get out of continuing to do these things over and over? And I get unrecognized, and then we fall into the self-absorption trap. Then we begin to grumble and complain. Then we start comparing ourselves to others, saying, well, they get better opportunities. They have a better platform. They have this. They have that. If you want this podium, you can... Ha- no, I guess that's Pastor Ray's going to have to make that decision. But look, I don't want this podium. I want the platform that anywhere that I shall tread my feet, that is a place for inheritance from me, for the kingdom of God. And it is time that we realize that everywhere we go is an opportunity for us to proclaim the gospel, to shine the light of Jesus, to give somebody in a dark time hope, to shine the light of Jesus. Look, time is short and it's time to get about the business. It's time to get our focus on. It is time for us to not pre or to assume. I could say what that makes me and you, but it's it's not not really good for back here or anywhere for that matter. But I was told a long time ago what assumption means, and I don't want any part of it. So in James chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, this is what it says for your reading pleasure, it's on the board. That every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He's saying that this is for everybody, and of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is so that you could be a first fruit. And so you could turn around and reproduce more fruit that the Apostle Paul says will abound unto your account. This is so that you can share what you know, share what you have received with somebody else so that it can be duplicated, the multiplication. Jesus did that with the 12, that if the 12 all won one, then that's 24 more. They went so much so with the comparison thing that they went to Jesus and began to whine and complain in the Gospels about these 70 that are out there casting out devils in your name. They're doing the works that we're doing in your name. You didn't send them. You called us. We're the ones that's supposed to carry the gospel. We're the ones that's supposed to be doing this. And this is Jesus' only response. Let them be. If they be for us, they're obviously not against us. Carry on. Guess what? Whether you're a janitor John Maxwell is big on this, and I love this dude because of this, and there's a lot of other successful people that are like this, that if you can't be a servant as a janitor, you'll never be a servant as a CEO. But there has been multiple times in biographies written about a janitor that becomes a CEO of a company because they were willing to lead from the toilet on up. From the worst place to the best place. And this is where the Word of God comes alive in our lives. That the last become first. But it's even greater in the kingdom of God. For a child who just gently whispers the name of Jesus to a friend or to a family member. Something as simple as giving a cup of cold water in God's name to a child. Is a greater than doing great and awesome things that we put levels in the church on. You see, we put levels on the anointing, we put levels on salvation, and we even put levels on sin. We think that the child abuser and the molester is worse than a murderer. Jesus called sin, sin, and it was no difference. It separated from God. If God can redeem me from the fall, He can redeem one of those. Now, there's things in place to protect. We're not ignorant. We're to be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. The gospel teaches us that. But, but again, my point is, is that we can't be so far removed from grace that we don't understand that it's to everyone that believes. To whosoever will. He says in this passage in Matthew that many are called but few are chosen. What do we think that means? A lot of people believe it means predestination. That, that they're, they're Calvinists in that sense and they, they literally believe that God selects and chooses who would be saved. But the Greek word says that they make a choice. It's given for whosoever will, but not everybody is going to accept the grace and the love of God. That's sad. That's really sad. And it's even sadder that if we're not careful as a church that we'll lose our hunger and thirst to reach the lost. 
There's nothing more sickening than just feeling good in church. We need to have a burden for the lost. We need a burden. I'm talking about a Holy Ghost burden. That we pray at the wee hours of the night, the wee hours of the morning, that there is some old Brush Harbor style things that take place in our life. Not talking about the old, but I'm talking about a true burden for the lost loved ones. That while there is still life and breath in their body, while their heart and their lungs are flowing and beating, then guess what? There is still a hope. There is still a hope that the Word of God can go to them and touch their heart and change their mind and they receive the goodness of God. There is still hope, church. The trump has not sounded. There is still hope. Time is short, but there is hope. So why not get the message out? Why not spread it like a wildfire? Why not? That's revival. That is true revival. It's the loss coming in. If we will just take note of following Acts chapter 2, that in chapter 3 there was 5,000 added, 3,000 added, 5,000 added, 2,000 added to the church daily. If we would just get out, and there is more Christians in America than anything. And it seems like we're having a troubling time getting the message out. But don't let the enemy fool you. The word is going forth. And there's a remnant that says we're not giving up and giving out. We're not laying down and shutting the door. We're going to preach the gospel in season and out. We're not going to be self-absorbed. We're not going to fall into the comparison trap. While churches are competing for position and, and titles and places within government to get, get, a, get a voice out there, you know what? Let them do it. Let them have those moments. But if I can't have a voice sitting on my couch, then I don't need a voice in the White House. I need to be the voice in in the wilderness crying prepare you the way of the Lord that we needed to be just like John that we're going to cry out and no matter where we are that we're going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and we have to be careful with that because with that comes good responsibility and we can't get it distorted and the fourth thing John says that Maxwell says is that distortion what, what happens whenever we begin to judge others as being unworthy or misfit or unfit for service. We wind up un misunderstanding that the entire kingdom of God is built upon grace and grace alone. Think about it. It's His unmerited favor, unearned favor that we're not consumed. It's because of who He is that He died like us. He took on sin for us. Separated it separated him from his father. He went into the lower parts of the earth and praised be unto God that there was a third day, that there was a moment, that there was a fourth watch, that there was a third hour, that there was a point where he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And now he's rendered unto you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and you can pursue him and reach others all in the same process. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it distorted. Don't start judging others. Be careful with that because in Matthew chapter 7, I absolutely love this chapter because there's a lot of good stuff in it whenever Jesus begins to teach, right? Who would have thought? But in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it will be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Hmm, interesting. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. The reason why we struggle with helping other people come out from under weight and burdens is because we're under weight and burdens ourselves. The Apostle Paul gave us a remedy. He said, set aside the weights that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before you. We need to be willing to first look within. I love the scripture that says judgment begins at the house of God. There's another one that says what? Know you not? 
that you are the temple of the Most High God. Man, he wears me out all the time with this stuff. He said, you don't know that you're the temple, that you are the house, you're where I dwell, you're my dwelling place? It's like, oh, so I need to look within. And he's like, uh, yeah, that's what I've been telling you this whole time. It's like, look within. Get your sights adjusted. Get it off of yourself and what you want for opportunity, what you want to be. You see, every time I've tried to do it on myself, it never worked. But then out of the woodwork, out of the blue, God creates an opportunity. And sometimes it's masked. I say it's masked. It's covered up because we have fear. We have worry. It's the unknown. It's not familiar. It's not something that we created. And so we set back at this door that's been opened and we look and we say, is this really God? And he's literally on the other side of the door saying, just come this way. You will see what I've got in store. Come on, start walking this way. But our eyes are not focused on the doorway. We're looking everywhere else. Jesus said that I am the door. I am the sheep gate. Anyone who comes into me, I will come with them. They will sup with me and I with them. We will dine together. We will have a fellowship together. Look, he's wanting to be with you every moment of the day. Every moment of your life. In the valley, on the mountain, in the cave, in the water, in the sea, in the wind. He wants to be in every part of your life. And thanks be unto God that when we didn't recognize He was there, He was there holding us together the whole time. Because here we are, we've made it through it. It's a new day and it's time to focus and get our sights readjusted. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10 It says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? You see, it would be a really bad thing if God just left it right there. But through the prophet in the next verse, this is what he says. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Even to give to everyone, every man, according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You see, these men, these workers in Matthew chapter 20, God came, or the, the, the good man of the house came to them and said, yo, I, I've got a penny a day to give you, give you work, a pence. It was like 17 cents was what the total would be as of like 2,000 or something. But, but they began to work. They were working for, I mean, just little bits, right? But back then it was worth a whole lot more weight. Um, but, but they were working for this. And then at the 11th hour, he went out multiple times through the day. But at the 11th hour, he went out and done the same thing. And he says, if you'll just come work in my vineyard, I'll give you what is due to you. We have to be careful not to get it distorted. That God gives to you the same opportunity and the same ability that he gives to Pastor Ray. Oh, well, that, that's not true. That's, that's not, no. You've got it twisted. Does God give to one greater than the other? He gives the same measure, the measure, the anointing, the opportunity, the plan to prosper, to give you future and to hope, even as your soul doth prosper. You see, here's where it gets really tricky. Because everything that God desires to do within us requires us to do something, to make a choice. Whenever I was about 17 years old, I went out hunting, and I knew I had dropped my rifle. I had test-fired it. I knew that at 50 yards it shot a half-inch low, and two inches to the left. I knew it, without a doubt. But every deer I had ever shot and had an opportunity to shoot was at 25 yards. And I thought, this is a great opportunity. I ain't got time to shoot. It's too early in the morning. I'll scare all the deer. So I went out and hunted anyway, knowing that my sights were off. I got this bright idea to get up because the ground was moist. Did y'all ever track deer? Like actually get up and start walking around and following where they were going. 
So they were doing a lot of logging in this, this uh, Bonham's land that's next to my granddad's land. And I was back behind our pond, and I was sitting down in my same old tree that I killed my last deer in, and I thought, this is going to be a good day. I'm going to get to see them and hear them before they see and hear me. But then I wanted to walk around. So I started walking around. Well, it just so happens the only deer that I was able to track and find was 100 yards away up on a bluff right in front of a big brush pile. I mean, you could not miss this deer. And I was like, opportunity. Wow. I was so excited. So I pull up my old trusty 3030, and I get it square right where it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I know this gun. I know everything about it. But you see, this funny thing is, is that there's these little cross areas on there that I had such a habit of staring at. I put that right behind that thing's shoulder, and I squeezed, and I watched the dirt underneath her belly fly up in the air. And then I remembered, the sights are off. At that moment, that opportunity had done raised the white flag and took off. Squawking and balking, and there was nothing else in this canyon after that, I guarantee it. There wasn't a crow left. There wasn't a dove left. There was nothing in there. Because after she did that, I went to yelling at this gun. And then the Lord checked me and said, Buddy, you knew before you took your first step. May we know before we take our first step, before we open our mouth and say a thing, may we have already looked within and know right where the target is. May our sights be true and our aim be true and we be swift to hear and slow to speak so that God can be glorified and his will be done. Don't be self-absorbed. Don't fall into comparison. Don't pre-assume anything. The last shall be first. Church, may we wind up being last in the race. May we bring up the rear, but in bringing up the rear, may we win, win the most. May we be burdened for the more. Look, we need to be his witness. We need humbled. We need to remain that way. That's how healing comes. That's how his will is done. May we conform our mind to his mind and have our hearts transformed to his heart. Our wills conform to his and our hearts transformed to his heart. Jesus died like us. I'll never get away from that statement so we could live like him. He gave it all up so you could have it, so you could use it. So go to your spiritual closet and put on those garments of praise. Put on that armor and be about his business. Don't give up on that one that's close to you that you know is lost. Don't, it may have been a long time. You may have been praying for a long time. Look, maybe you're in your 21st day. Huh? And the Prince of Persia is about to be silenced. Maybe you're in your moment where the stone's going to roll back, where the water's going to peel back. Maybe you're in that moment where, where the, the clouds are going to separate and you're going to see the salvation of your God. Maybe you're on the edge of that battlefield thinking you're about to have to swing a sword and sling a bow. But look, God said out of my mouth will come a sword. God will fight for you. Just stay humbled. Keep your sights true and adjusted and centered on Him and let Him do the work in you. If you're here and you're you're here and you're lost, or if you're online and you're lost and you need a readjustment, you need refocus, you're here and you're saved, and you need refocused and recentered, then this is your opportunity to get recentered and refocused on him as Sean comes. It's a simple process. We just look to the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, it's been tried, it's been tested, and it's been found true. In the courts of heaven, in the courts of this earth, and even in hell, it's been found true. His word is from everlasting to everlasting. It is settled, and he says that you, he is faithful, and he is just to cleanse us, to forgive us, and to empower us, and to give us all good things. It's his will 
for you to be a voice in the wilderness. It's His will for you. It's, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it like I'm giving it. To take your place. It's okay to come in last. I need to say that. I'm very competitive and I hate that. But in the kingdom, it's okay to come in last. There is many of warriors that went home, prayer warriors, that may have never stood behind a pulpit. They may have never stood up and preached a great sermon. But whenever they stood before Christ, on the day that they departed and they were presence with the Lord, that they got to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in. I long to hear that. But I'm not ready to go. There's a lot of names running through my head right now. Pastor brought it up last week and it really pricked something in me. There's a lot of people. But there's been moments that I've almost gave up on. Like there's nothing else that can be done. God forgive me. Because they're still breathing. Their heart is still beating. And no matter how seared the mind, how seared the conscience, the gospel is power. And it can break every yoke. It can cut through every wound and get right to the heart of a thing. His word is settled. And he says, your whole house can be saved. Lord, we come, Lord, and we ask, Father God, Lord, that for those that are on our mind today, Lord, and for us, Lord, as individuals, that our sight picture, Lord, will become clear. That we make the adjustments needed and necessary, Father God, Lord, to see the true picture, Lord, of what you have before us. Lord, that we would stop looking back so far, Father God, Lord, but that we would look forward to the hope, Lord, to the high prize. Lord, in all these names, Lord, that are flooding the minds of your people today, Lord, we bring them to you. Lord, and we ask, Father, Lord, that you would send your word, Lord, and tear down every wall in the name of Jesus. Lord, every hindrance, Lord, everything that would stop Lord, the gospel from penetrating, Father, Lord, every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of you, Lord, in your word, Lord, be brought down in Jesus' name. Lord, begin to touch and convict, Lord, their heart. Lord, humble them, Lord, in your presence. Lord, humble us, Lord, in your presence. Lord, give us that burden, Lord, that we once felt for all of our friends and our loved ones, Lord, to come to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, if there be any under the sound of our voice today, Lord, that don't know you, Lord, may they confess with their mouth that you are Lord Jesus. That you died and you rose again. That you died to cover our sin. Lord, and to forgive us. Lord, and that they would accept you today as their Lord and Savior and believe in their heart. Lord, and they too should be saved. Lord, and I give you all the praise and all the glory for it. Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Lord, I pray for a burden. Lord, for the lost sheep. Lord, to come back to your house. Lord, that we would bombard heaven. Lord, that we would storm the gates of hell. Lord, that we would run into the fire to save those, Lord, that are in need. Lord, give us the desire, Lord, of your heart. May it become our desire. Lord, and may we be your voice. Lord, may we be clothed with humility and your righteousness. Lord, to do all that you've called us to do. Lord, and thank you, Father, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Lord, while we were out in sin, Lord, in trespasses, Lord, you still loved us and you still died for us to give us a hope and a future. Lord, may you become that hope and that future to our loved ones. Lord, to those that are in need, to this community, may we be a city on a hill that cannot be hid. Lord, a light shining in darkness. Lord, and we'll give you all the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Any needs in the house this morning before we dismiss? Amen. Hearts and minds clear. Oh, come on.
Let's get some ladies to come pray for her. For those of you that didn't know, she wound up in a wreck and thank God for his protection on her. But she's got some soreness and she just needs a touch from the Lord. Amen. Complete healing. Amen. In Jesus' name. We're believing with you. Amen. Oh, thank you for the angels. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise, Lord. And we ask, Father God, Lord, that you would touch her physical body. Lord, that you would remove every ounce of discomfort, Lord, and pain. Lord, we thank you for your protecting hand upon her, Lord. We pray, Father, Lord, that you would touch her now. Lord, in Jesus' holy name, Lord, bring full healing to her. Lord, in Jesus' holy name, Lord, I give you all the glory and the praise, Lord, that there is no gap. Lord, there is no gulf. Lord, it's been bridged. Lord, and you can reach down from heaven now, Lord, and touch her physical body. Lord, and bring healing in Jesus' holy name. Lord, and I give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Turn it around for her good, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Full mobility in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any other needs? Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. We're good? good? Hallelujah. Be with us tonight. Night service. We're going to have another awesome message preached in this house. We're excited. Be in prayer for the minister. Amen. Man. As you go, be his witness, be his voice, be his hands and be his feet. And let's reach a lost and dying world for Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed.